So embodiment and drumming eudaimonia, coming out as a rock musician, is what I'll be talking about. Uh, this is a haiku that I wrote myself um, to try and get a sense of how important drumming is to me. I think I was on a plane when I wrote it. Um, and it says the same thing a few times, but in different ways. Um, I was trying to capture with this that it's about th the actual drumming part that is so important. Uh, being a drummer is great, but it's when I'm drumming, something else happens. Um, I'm always a drummer, but it's the in-the-momentness um, that this talk is about, really, and that's uh, something I was trying to capture. I hadn't really seen it described anywhere, and all the kind of talk and writing that I've come across uh, about drumming missed for me the, the sort of the essence of why I play. Uh, you can read a lot about rhythm, you can read a lot about, um, you can read a bit about groove, but I, it never really seemed to tap into the reason I play drums, which is basically I love it and it makes me feel fantastic. There's uh, no other reason to do it because it's you know expensive and time consuming and really antisocial. So uh, <laughs> it just makes me feel good, <coughs> essentially. I could stop there, but I've got half an hour to fill. <laughs> no. So uh, the T-shirt the and the book match, you'll see. Um, I found the T-shirt first online. It popped up one day. So I named my uh, PhD thesis and then book, uh, I Drum Before I Am, Not About Me, which was, um, even though it looks like it is, it's not about me. I gave a talk about this book and the research um, leading to the book at uh, University of Cambridge a few years ago. And I'm very proud of it, you know, because it had just come out as a book. And uh, afterwards, we were having dinner, and the person who'd invited me to speak said, interesting, but I think you're missing the point. You know, there's a really, there's a piece missing from your research. And I said, well, what's that? And they said, well, embodiment, the, the, the you, where's the kind of, there's something you're saying, but you're not saying, in a way. There's a, the embodiment piece is missing. And I hadn't really thought about it. I had no idea, really, what she was talking about. Um, so I looked it up. I looked into what, what embodiment could be, what that means, um, and to see if that could help explain some of the things I was trying to get to. Um, also, uh, popped up in the book, I came across the concept of eudaimonism. Some say eudaimonia. Um, I think that was in the title. So there's a, some people think it's not yet an ism. Um, I'm not familiar enough with the research to know. I think it's an ism or an ear. So eudaim eudaimonism, uh, Aristotle, it's his idea. And um, there's a guy called Norton who published a book in 76 that talks about it very helpfully, I found. And it's this idea of living one's own truth constituting integrity the consummate virtue. It's a virtuous thing to pursue your, your own truth. My own truth is being a drummer. I'm pursuing it. And I like this idea because it kind of validated my really selfish lifestyle choices about making lots of noise all the time because I want to. And I thought, oh, well, that's, it's an ancient Greek philosophy and it's the consummate virtue. Therefore, I have every right and reason and a responsibility, in fact, to play the drums. Um, so that was good to read. Um, it's this. It's a feeling and a condition, way of being. It signals that the present activity, the thing I'm doing, is in harmony with the daemon, that is, my true self. Great. It's very encouraging, you know. Um, we learn that there are isolated individuals in whom the intuition of their own unique potential worth has in some measure proved formative. I think I'm worth pursuing. For them, the world's din has not stilled the inner voice, and they are quietly, not quietly, actually, in my case, yet decisively living their lives according to their inner imperative, just pursuing that thing. So to read this stuff was really self-affirming for me. Um, and here are some pictures of me rocking out. Um, despite the identical faces left and right, those are separate points in the same gig. Um, I have three drum faces. You might see the other one later if you're lucky. Um, there's, a, there's a kind of different overbite that pops up, and occasionally like a half smile. Um, so. But it's, it's eudaimonic, you know. So I am these things. I am not music. Uh, music is in the centre of the things I do and am. I, I'm a drummer. I'm an academic, a scholar, a teacher, and a writer. Um, and I've been looking for a way for a while to combine all the things that I do. They always made sense. Everything started with drumming. Um, then I became a teacher. Then I got into academia. And I love writing, always have. Hence the haiku and the book. Um, and I was trying to find a way to merge them. I've recently... Uh, well, not recently, hopefully soon we'll have a journal article accepted called Embodied Experience of Rock Drumming in the journal Music and Practice. Um, they told me I need to revise the article, so I'm working on that. Um, but it's gonna be, I'm, I'm quite excited about having been doing research about drumming for uh, 
since 2007, so 10 years. And finally, I think I'm trying to say what I was trying to say all along. I'm going to get a chance to say it, which is quite exciting, quite eudaimonic. Uh, and the opportunity arose um, with this album, um, which is yet to be released. This is the artwork for Armageddon, End of the Beginning by V1. Um, I did a master's degree last year, the final module for which I had to play a concert and do a, write a dissertation, and they were sort of about each other. So the dissertation was all about the um, embodied eudaimonic thing. That led to the paper I've submitted to the journal, and I was, I was trying to demonstrate that embodiment in this music. Uh, and it felt pretty good. It, was al it also had that kind of exam feel where it felt dreadful at the same time. Um, so <coughs> it was a mixed, fi mixed experience, but it was great to have the opportunity. I was glad to have found the, the chance you know, to kind of understand it in these ways. So there are some quotes, uh, lots of quotes here about what it was I was trying to capture. Uh, Merleau-Ponty, um, a famous philosopher, a phenomenologist, talks about another type, of another type of intelligibility. So he's talking other than sort of intellectual understanding. There's a way of understanding things that's bodily. Um, his, his book, The, phen the phen yeah, bleh bleh. Phenomenology of Perception, is about perceiving things but not kind of necessarily understanding them. Not that. Understanding them in a way that we don't usually think of as understanding. Um, so um, Bourdieu talks about this, talks about behaviours which, which engage a corporeal, a bodily knowledge that provides a practical understanding of the world. Quite different from the intentional act of conscious decoding, he calls it. Um, designated by the idea of comprehension. So it's changing the way we think of comprehension, understanding. You understand things. Footballers have this, you know. They're incredible um, understanders of things. Maybe not sort of intellectually, maybe they can't necessarily express it verbally always, but there's an incredible understanding and knowledge uh, that's undeniable in the, um, you know, in the ability to play football really well. Um, as an actual experience, we learn, music is a physical phenomenon and in the context of music, it is not at all contentious to claim that not only experience, but knowledge is located in the body. So I was getting all these different people saying, knowledge is, there is bodily knowledge, it's a real thing. Um, found it really interesting to think of that. I'd always thought of knowledge as something that was you know, in your head, articulated, you write it down. Academia does that to you as well. It makes you write things down, you know, dissertations, essays. Um, especially in music. Actually, uh, theatre arts and dance are, are sort of way ahead of us, uh, of musicians, in terms of, you, know, you can dance a PhD thesis. Um, doing that in music, you know, performing it is yes, less common. Um, so more ideas. But theorising is just one practice among others. Theorising is a practice. Performing is a practice. Okay. Um, meaning is grounded in our bodily experience. It means something. And this was, this was resonated as well. I was thinking, yeah, it does. It means, it means something. It's not just understanding. There's a real value. You know, it's intrinsic to me. It's eudaimonic, again, that thing. Um, and the, so this idea that knowledge... The, the term knowledge should be approached cautiously. I know there's tons of quotes here, but I was trying to find a kind of, trying to understand that it wasn't just a mad idea, but there might be something sort of valuable and actually uh, that I could bring to my academic work, I suppose, to understand what I'm doing. There's a sort of irony, isn't there, in that I'm finding all these words to express the thing that you shouldn't be expressing in words. It's kind of uh, <laughs> self-defeating or, I don't know. It's something. Um, but the, the phenomenal, phen I can't say it now, Phenomenology of Perception book is really thick. It's like 450 pages talking about how you shouldn't be writing it down, basically. Um, so th this I find to be true as a drummer. You know, musical meaning is made through interaction with others. Uh, genuinely engaging in music, you have to genuinely engage. I do like to practice drums. It's nice on my own, but it's always better in a band. I love playing in rock bands. It's the best thing for me. I like nothing more than to be in a rehearsal room where we're really, really loud and everyone's just rocking out. It's brilliant. It's always, not always, often better than being on stage because it's the sound's coming at you from off the walls and everything. You know, the sound's not disappearing into a field or whatever. It's great. Cause it all, you can feel the bass guitar going through your legs and it's, it's just, it's fantastic. I love the volume. I don't really like loud noises in my ears. I just, but I like the kind of, it's like when you have music really loud in the car, you know, it's, it feels awesome. I love it. Very exciting. Very self-indulgent, you know. Um, so what is this? Ah, that's the other drumming place. Look, I told you, it's the, uh, that's the second overbite. Parents are proud. Um, so, <laughs> they say, so this idea that feedback is immediate. And that happens, that's why I like the drums as well. You hit them, they sound great. That's basically it. Um, and this helped me think about, yeah, there's something, when I, it's, not, it's not really in my ears. I hit the drums and I'm like, yes, that was awesome. Um, most of the time, you know. Yeah. Very exciting. Um, I sort of feel sort of kinship with Animal from the Muppets, you know, despite the fact I'm not pink. Uh, it's like, yes. There's... Um, 
Yeah, he's good. Still a kinship. So another epic quote. Action and awareness merge, so doing things and feeling them at the same time. Doing and thinking are fused together, uh, which we don't often think about, I suppose. Uh, we can be fully present. So this is another thing I wanted to think about, I wanted to kind of understand, being fully present in the moment of our musical creation. We devote our entire selves to the experience. Um, and that's what happens when you're playing, or when I'm playing. It's just, it's all about that moment. And I was trying to capture that. That's what happens when I rock out. It's right now. It's not about any theoretical, abstract thing. It's right now. Um, so being transported by music, by m making the music. And this idea of presence, being present in performance. So, um, Salome Vergelin um, talks about this. She's, a, this sort of, she's writing about um, sound uh, rather than music. She talks about music because she's talking about sound primarily. So talking about the sonic now, kind of poetry really, these ideas. Uh, she has time space as a word, and I like that idea that kind of helps explain now, that, that thing that's happening, time space. Um, sound is its own immediate sensibility, so you feel it as it happens. That's obvious, but it's also, yeah, there's something in that, the sound coming back at you off the drums, you know, and making the sound being part of it. And the emotional investment is important. I, I'm heavily emotionally invested in it. You know, there's, it's, yeah. Emotions are why I play. Um, and it's calling an aesthetic moment. So it's, it's about a kind of a beauty and, a, and an, ex an experience. That's really the thing. And sensation, feeling, meets perception. So it's about understanding and feeling and sensation. And those words that mean slightly different things and the same thing all coming together. <coughs> so... Uh, the performance of music is an embodied event. Let's not ignore that. It is. It's in the body. Um, the physical body becomes one with the instrument. And, like, not literally, obviously, but it's, like, the, you, you know, it, it, it does. Those of you, you know, that musicians know that. You just are the instrument in a, in a kind of, in a, in, a, in a way that feels real. You are. So, feeling the groove. Um, I couldn't find much writing about this, really. People write about it, sort of, and a bit, but not what I was thinking about. And I wanted to sort of understand it a bit better. Um, so I wrote, wrote a blog post about playing with my eyes closed. Um, it was called Playing With My Eyes Closed, because that's what I often do. When I'm, in a, when I'm you know, completely in the moment, I'm very, very focused, using ears, using my body, and I'm not really opening my eyes very often. And it wasn't just about that, but it was about that immersion in the moment, about that nowness, feeling the groove, not thinking about it, not knowing that it's one, two, three, four, but feeling it. The groove is a feel. Um, and I wrote this. I said, I'm completely absorbed in the song. The music is all I hear, all that I am in those moments. Going into the music, I'm happy to descend into the music, content to be enveloped by it. Being in a song, in a piece of music, is a total immersion of myself, emotionally, mentally, physically. And it is that. Uh, so I found a guy called Richard Schusterman, a couple of books by him that really, th that these are the first things that I think properly captured the thing I was trying to articulate with these other uh, scholars I've come across. He wrote a book in 2000 that talks about aesthetic experience. And that very much speaks to what I was trying to talk about. I think what I'm talking about is aesthetic experience. It's what he calls aesthetic experience. He had an another book a few years later um, when he talks about soma aesthetics, or soma aesthetics, which is about improved use of the self. Um, some of that resonates with this as well. Okay, so these are what he says. Aesthetic, this is kind of, there are four tenets about aesthetic experience. The fourth one is less relevant at this point. But the first three, aesthetic experience is essentially valuable and enjoyable. That's the point of it. We do it because it's valuable and enjoyable. Like the eudaimonic thing, I'm doing it because I have to do it. It's a responsibility. It's something vividly felt. It's, you know, it's really bright and subjectively savoured. It's all about the person who's doing it, getting it, understanding it. And it absorbs us, focusing our attention on that now, which is what these other guys were saying. It's, it is meaningful experience. It's not, just, it's not just sensation, it's not just, oh, it feels good. It's more than that. It's like, this is why I dedicate my time and my life to this stuff. Um, so he says, in, in talking about contemporary society, of society nine years ago anyway, um, too many of our somatic pleasures, bodily pleasures, uh, we, we hurry through them. We don't really pay attention. And that's probably true. I'm always in a rush, you know, too many things to do. But drumming, that's one of the times I'm able to just focus on now. Um, sometimes riding a bike, but um, that's to get to work usually, you know, it's not focused, whereas drumming is really for its own sake a lot of the time. All right, I swear there are not too many more massive quotes. Um, so I wrote this trying to get a sense of it. Um, the listening and feeling become one in a cyclical, instantaneous, 
intrapersonal feedback loop between my head, hands, feet, every sinew of my body. And on the best days, every part of my being. Sometimes, you know, you can't stop thinking about that thing you've got to do, or that argument you had, or whatever it is. But sometimes, everything comes together, and it's just the whole piece works. Um, the loop is also interpersonal. Uh, and I wish it could be every time, but sometimes, you know, it's not always perfect, but that's what we aspire to. It's what I aspire to. Um, yeah, and it's frustrating, because I'm good at playing the drums. I'm not good at many things, actually. And when that goes wrong, I feel like it's so deep. Like, that has to be... That's the one place that I know, on a good day, it can be really good. And that's like, that's it. That's, that's the reason we're here. I'm here. Um, okay, so a couple of other thoughts here. But sensing is always... Um, this feeling oneself feel, that's, that's that feedback loop I was talking about. You kind of, you feel, but you know you feel, and there's a kind of, yeah, an acknowledgement of that. Um, so the slightly more poetic language again. Um, that I like this sort of something sort of metaphysical about it. Sonorous time takes place immediately according to a completely different dimension. It's not that of succession. It's present in, a, in waves on a swell, not in a point on a line. It's a time that opens up, is hollowed out, that is enlarged, ramified, stretches out. When you play, when I play, when we play, things happen. It's time feels different. Um, so I like this language. It helped me kind of think, yeah, that's, that's a bit like what it is. And I'm going to play some drums to a song called Invisible to the Touch by Stephen Wheel. Uh, they're right where I left them. All right. <coughs> it's no glasses. So. All righty.
hope that's okay for everybody else. Um, a final thought from Ellen Disanayaki. You can read this. So it's only really real if you're playing the drums <laughs> <laughs> for yourself or for your friend Steve. <laughs> Okay, so do we have any questions for Gareth? Or comments, abuse? <laughs> Put your hand up and we'll come to you. Hey, uh, I have a question. Well, what led you to, uh, you know, want to write about this sort of stuff, about this embodiment and everything? Or Thank you. Yeah, I think I missed that out of the talk, didn't I? I think the first, the trigger for it was when um, Pam Bernard at Cambridge said to me, um, I think you should think about this. There's something missing, you know, from... I'm hearing you talk over dinner, but I know there's stuff missing from your research that I think you're trying to say. Um, that. And also, yeah, the piece about sort of coming out as a rock drummer, I think... Um, you know, I studied classical music uh, through college and studied jazz at college and sort of always felt like I should be doing jazz um, because, you know, it's better or more sophisticated or, you know, it's cleverer. But I'm just not that good at it. I can kind of play it. I can play the stuff, but you're not allowed to hit things hard enough. You know, you have kind of dark symbols that sound awesome, but you know, you can't like. Ah, ah, there's no place for that. Um, they don't actually make the symbol that's as thick as I needed to be to play that song properly anymore. Um, maybe one day I'll speak to Zildjian about that. But I, so it took me a long time to kind of. I mean, relatively recently, like no, I know, a handful of years ago, to be like, actually, you know what? Maybe I'm actually better at rock, and maybe that's okay. Um, Maybe that's just okay. There you go. And so it was, yeah, so, and th so that tied in with the, I suppose the kind of point of the eudaimonic thing about realizing that I'm a rock drummer, that's okay, that's who I am, and I'm going to sort of nail my colors to that. And, uh, and, the, and the suggestion that embodiment might be an idea. And the more I read about it, I was like, yeah, this is what I'm trying to capture. Oh, and the other piece is the embodiment thing doesn't come about when I'm playing jazz. It's all a bit like, you know, uh -huh. thinking too hard. Um, there's nothing happening here. It's like, yeah, this is lovely, but you know, I'm actually bored or distracted. <laughs> but when I'm like, <coughs> then nothing else is happening apart from that moment. And that's what's cool about it. It's like, it happens when you know, runners get it, the runner's high, it's something like that. It's something that's utterly immersive. And that's what I, I think that's what I'm seeking. You know, I'm, I'm always thinking. My mind's you know, always racing. I never stop thinking, except when I mean, it's just, that's the only thing going on right then. You know. Um, I came close at that point. I, I was also a bit concerned about, I just knocked the microphone off and I was like, shit, and then the sound came in two earphones and then one, and I was like, well, that was weird. So, but I mostly I was trying to focus on, <laughs> you know, the thing. Yeah. Do we have any other questions? R Ross? Uh, the way you talk about rock drumming kind of makes it sound as if you don't suffer from performance anxiety at all. Is that true? Uh, that's totally untrue. Um, I suffer from... Suffer is it's a strong term. I have tremendous performance anxiety, which is why I couldn't say phenomenology <laughs> properly <laughs> earlier on. Uh, it's why I talk quickly. Um, it's not as bad as when I was, up until I was about 20, and I used to you know, put your hand up in class and I used to sweat profusely and turn red and couldn't, you know, all that stuff. Um, and yeah, I used to, when I was playing clarinet, I used to get horrendous nosebleeds performing and uh, yeah. I always I get I do get performance anxiety. I I had spent a lot of time coaching myself that today would be all right because the start of that track when it's um before the fill comes in the big ba do ba ba do do ba do ba do all that stuff. There's I can't hear the guitar that well because he's the vocal's quite loud and the guitar's a bit distorted and it, I've never got it clean in the cans and I can't hear the rhythm properly. And I was like, ah, how hard can it be? It's me on the recording. Don't worry, you won't fuck up the fill because you played it on the recording. So, uh, so, I was, so I was like, oh, yeah, go on. And I said, don't even think about it going wrong. It'll be fine. And if it does go wrong, it goes wrong. So I, I, I kind of have to talk myself down a lot. But I do know 
that there's you know the domain of rock drumming. I always feel like if I pl whenever I play a jazz gig, which is rarely these days, you know, I'm always thinking, are oh, they going to find out? They're just going to know. I don't know what they're going to do, but they're going to they're going to know. Uh, and the same happens with other things, you know. Like on functions, I'm like, ah, oh, they're just you know, people are funky, and I'm not I'm not that funky right now. I just you know. Um, so yeah, self doubt and tre tre uh, yeah, tremendous performance anxiety. But I know I can I know I can bring it on the drums in a you know. Me and Steve have been playing together 20 years this year, so I know that it works. I feel very confident and nurtured, you know, in that, in that relationship. Um, yeah. And uh, so I suppose, and I think maybe, um, I feel all right teaching, you know, giving lectures and all right at that. But there's teaching and rock drumming are usually the only two kind of places. I, I did a lot of gigs with an Aerosmith tribute band for a, a long time. Um, and they were always, I never had, never really got nervous with that. I was just like, yeah, I'm setting up and it's going to be... <laughs> but yeah, so I do. <laughs> but it's easier not to have it when I'm playing rock drums. It happens the least, the least kind of sweatily and malfunctiony, and you know, uh, yeah, the, the effects are less visible. <coughs> okay, does anybody have it? any other questions? I'm shaking now, actually. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the West Plate of that point that like embodiment, it's quite uh, like specific to music, and that you've got an immediate reaction to it. Yeah. Do you try and cultivate a similar sort of state of mind when you're doing other things, like when you're writing and things like that, like cultivate a sort of sense of flow? Or mm. do you kind of just designate it for drums and you're happy to leave it at that? No, it, I think it does, I haven't, it does cross over into other things. I think the embodied piece isn't really there, you know, because the other stuff I do is so cerebral. It doesn't, it's not about embodiment then. I mean, I do, I am very easily, it's really easy to make me jump if I'm doing something and someone says Gareth, I'm like, oh! <laughs> I'm always so focused on things, but that's not really embodiment. I think that's just, uh, it's, just a, it's just unfortunate that I have to concentrate on things I'm doing. Um, and I'm, I'm really snappy, you know. Yes! You know, I try and, try and get, I can't. Uh, but no, I do, I do get really, I, I'm really, yeah, that's a definitely a thing for me. I'm really in, into what I'm doing, whatever it is. Uh, but the only time I really get that embodied thing is then. Um, it happens, well, I said it, I mean, I, I, did, a, I did three marathons, um, uh, not at the same time. <laughs> and th there was something happening with those as well. There was there was something, you know. But there's also quite a lot of pain and discomfort and sort of fear that I didn't bring my oyster card to get home if I can't make it. You know. um, so, uh, no, drumming is the, the only space that all those things come together for me. Yeah. Okay. Everywhere else, I think I'm just not confident enough. Yeah, sorry. That's <laughs> alright. Yeah. Uh, maybe time for one more question. I was just wondering, see if you, do you think it's, if, if somebody's not experiencing this feeling of, you know, full embodiment yeah. or whatever, when they play their instrument, do you think you could still uh, make a successful career in doing music and performance without sure. it? Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure you don't need it. Um, I'm sure you don't. Um, and it's, th no, so it's totally valid, you know, to understand things in other ways and to feel things perhaps to a lesser degree. And I'm sure I've, I've, I'm sure I'm, I've done fine and I've not been, you know, lost in the moment found in the moment, I think, <laughs> is the point. Um, I mean that, you know. Uh, so, yeah, it, totally, you don't need this. Um, but uh, but it's, that's, it's, it's really self-indulgent, but it's, it was kind of, uh, it was, I mean, it's, it's, it's about making music, it's not necessarily about whether this is commercially successful or whatever, that's not the point, it's just when I'm making music, that's, this is what happens. Not, therefore, I'll be better on a gig. Um, I haven't taken it to that, I don't know. It's not really the point. I mean, it's a good question, but I mean, it's not, that's not what, that's not why I, you know, that's not the point that I'm trying to make. I think it's just understanding, I'm trying to make sense of my own practice and feel, feel, understand. And, uh, and, I, and I think, you know, I teach a lot. And I, I taught drums for, for a long time. And, um, you know, I think there's, I just wondered if other people felt this as well, that there was something, that maybe the reason they're playing drums is not all the things we teach I teach them about technique and things, which obviously help and you need those things. But actually there's some kind of essential, there's something else that might be this that's actually going on. And it might be just worth acknowledging that as a kind of, you know, I get it, you know. I know why you're, I know what you're doing. Okay, thank you very much, Gareth. Thank you. Thank you.